Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third season of Scientifically Speaking, an interactive online lecture series that connects world-renowned scientists to high school students and teachers, carefully curated to inspire, excite, and ignite young minds in the field of scientific research. This interdisciplinary lecture series aims to help students develop a creative way of looking at life and connect their learnings to address real world problems. Our speaker for the lecture today is Kavita Babu, Associate Professor, Center for Neuroscience, IISC, Bangalore. To moderate the session, we have with us Ms. Ruchi Sahani from the Dune School, Dehradun. Ruchi has about 17 years of experience in teaching and administration at schools in India. She is currently teaching biology, ESS and global perspectives, along with being a housemaster for a boarding school at the Dune School. She has done her biology, zoology honors, I'm sorry, from Gargi College, Delhi University, followed by a master's in zoology with specialization in reproductive biology and neuroendocrinology from Delhi University. Inclined towards teaching since the beginning, she did her B.Ed. followed by successfully completing IPGCE from UCL. She started her teaching career from Delhi and has, all, and has enjoyed wearing multiple hats by assuming many roles and responsibilities. She teaches CBSC, ISC, IB, and IGCSC curriculum to high school students. A very warm welcome to you, Ruchi, and kindly take it from here and introduce our guest. Thank you very much, Parneet. A very warm welcome to our audience, and it's an honor to moderate the session for today. I would like to start with a thank you note to Ashoka University for organizing season three of the lecture series on diverse scientific topics. I move on now to introduce our speaker for the day. Professor Kavita completed her undergraduate degree in physics, chemistry, and mathematics from St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. She then attended the MSc Biotechnology program at the Maharaja Say Sayajri Rao University, Baroda, but left midway to pursue her doctorate at Professor William Chia's laboratory at the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology, Singapore, King's College MRC Center for Developmental Neurobiology, London, and Temasek Life Sciences Laboratory. She then pursued her postdoctoral research at Professor Josh Kaplan's laboratory at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston. Subsequently, in August 2011, she joined IISER Mohali. After spending more than seven years in Mohali, Kavita moved back to home and is currently gearing up to study aspects of C. elegans nervous system at the Center for Neurosciences at Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. She is a recipient of various prestigious awards and fellowship, including the Department of Biotechnology Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award and DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance Senior Fellowship, respectively. Kavita, a very warm welcome, and I'm sure our audience, like me, is intrigued by the connections in the proteins in a neuron of a worm and humans. So without further delay, over to you to transmit the understandings and learnings from a worm. Thank you so much, Ruchi, for your kind introduction. I'm just going to get my uh, screen on. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yes, Dr. Bikin. Yes, okay, wonderful. Um, so today I'm hoping that I can uh, try and convince some of you that maybe apart from looking at mice, vertebrate organisms, maybe one can also study these other organisms which are invertebrate and especially the small tiny worm, which we call Sinonoptatus elegans, um, to study aspects of how neurons function and how synapses work. So just to give you a brief introduction, all of us know that a brain, our brain is one of the most important organs of our body. It's required 
uh, for us to do everything, be it walking, thinking, talking, moving, everything requires our brain. And the brain is made up of a large number of cells that are called neurons. These neurons are constantly talking to other neurons. And just to give you a very brief understanding of how the neurons speak to each other, you have an action potential that comes across the axon of a neuron, okay? I'm just showing you one end of the neuron. You have the axon up. Uh, let me just see if the laser pointer works or not. You have the axon up and it goes towards the axonal tip. And this causes calcium influx into the axon. This then causes release of a chemical that's called a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter then binds to proteins that are on the postsynaptic neuron or postsynaptic cell and causes changes in the postsynaptic cell. This causes changes in the activity of the postsynaptic cell. And this is what allows us to do pretty much everything that we do. Be it talking, eating, everything requires of this activity between two neurons. <clears throat> so now coming to the system that I work on, it's called Synerhepatitis elegans. And essentially it's just a small free living nematode. It's, uh, it's found in soil and also likes fruits. And what, uh, what, so why would we want to use this small nematode to allow us to study the brain or to allow us to study neurons and their connections? So what we do know about the human brain is there are more than a hundred billion neurons. That's a very large number of neurons. And to actually study all of them would be very difficult. C. elegans on the other hand has exactly 302 neurons. And this makes things a lot simpler because you know where each neuron is, you know who each neuron is connected to. And uh, you also know how, uh, uh, how each neuron forms connections to other neurons. The human brain has around 10 trillion synapses, which are essentially the connections between the neurons, while C. elegans has around 7,000 synapses. Again, this number is far more manageable. However, when you start looking at protein coding genes, the human brain has around 25,000 genes, while C. elegans has around 20,000 genes. And many of the genes, be it genes uh, that are transcription, that code for transcription factors, that code for cell surface molecules, that code for the proteins that are subunits of the postsynaptic receptors, be it any kind of um, you know, important molecule, the worm has many of them conserved with humans, making it a very nice system to start understanding at a very molecular level, at the level of the genes and proteins, what the gene, genes and proteins are doing at the synapse and in neurons. And that's essentially what our, our laboratory is very interested in. Now, just to let you, uh, uh, just to have you see um, uh, uh, C. elegans, this is essentially a microscope that allows us to look at C. elegans. C. elegans is a transparent organism. And you can see it when you have light both from um, a, a source which is up as well as light from the bottom. And we just grow C. elegans on plates, just very similar to uh, plates that you grow bacteria on. There are some differences, but largely it looks similar. And then we put a little bit of bacteria on the plates. And the worms actually feed on bacteria. And you can see that this is just worms um, uh, under the microscope. You can see different stages of worms. You can see the stars that they indicate the eggs. Um, and you have smaller worms here, larger worms here. So, it, and these worms are essentially hermaphrodites that give out around 300 to 320 eggs per worm. And they give rise to that many more hermaphrodites. However, there are also male worms. So you can actually do a lot of very nice genetics where you cross the males with the hermaphrodites and actually get different genetic backgrounds. So this is just to show you the life cycle of a worm. So one of the advantages of working with C. elegans is that it has a very, or at least a comparatively short life cycle of three days um, compared to most other organisms. 
And it goes through uh, three different stages of larval development, which are L1, L2, and L3, after the first few uh, stage, after the stages of embryonic development, then it goes through, uh, sorry, it goes through four different stages of larval development. It goes to L4 as well, and then molds to give rise to the adult. The adult then lays the eggs and the cycle continues. Uh, and this is since this is a three day cycle, it's very fast to do genetics and to get progeny of different mutant, uh, different uh, mu mutants. I said earlier that C. elegans was a transparent organism. And you can see here that it's, uh, this is a live worm, which is being imaged with GFP in some of the neurons. You can see that it's a transparent organism, where you can just see GFP when you just do a live imaging of the worm. And um, one of the last advantages that I'm going to talk about is that it's very easy to knock down genes in C. elegans. Um, RNAi or RNA interference has been uh, studied la uh, widely in many different organisms and it's used to knock down genes of interest. Here, um, we can just put a, a vector, a piece of DNA, which contains your gene of interest. In this case, it's GFP. Um, the, uh, into a bacteria and allow the, bacteria, uh, allow the bacteria to be eaten by the worm, which you want to knock down the protein of interest and you will, you will be able to actually see the knockdown. And this is to give you an example. You have GFP in what are called seam cells here. Very nicely, you can see the GFP spots. And in this image here, you, you can see that there is no GFP because the worm has eaten these bacteria, which contains the double standard DNA against the, the GFP and completely knocks down the GFP the GFP. You can do this for any gene in C. elegans. So you can knock down genes very easily in C. elegans. All of this makes it a really robust and interesting system to study molecules that are involved in different processes. In our lab, we essentially studied mo molecules that are in involved in nervous system function. And I'm going to tell you a very short story about one such molecule. And uh, it's going to go into a little bit of uh, you know detailed work, and I apologize for you know being using a little bit of jargon in my talk. So, what am I going to tell you today about? I'm going to tell you a little bit about a neurotransmitter or a chemical which is called dopamine. Dopamine is a very important chemical that's found in everybody's brain, and uh, it's in your brain. It's in the brain of worms, Drosophila. It's it's in most organisms. It's a biogenic amine neurotransmitter. And it regulates many important physiological functions from emotions to coordination of locomotion to cognition. Multiple diseases are associated with defects in dopamine. One of the very well-known diseases is Parkinson's disease where the patient has lower amounts of dopamine and this causes locomotory defects. <clears throat> So we wanted to study something about dopaminergic neurons in C. elegans. So the first thing you have to know is which are the dopaminergic neurons in C. elegans. Now, I told you there are only 302 neurons. There are many neurons in humans and other mammals that are dopaminergic. In C. elegans, there are exactly eight neurons that send out the neurotransmitter dopamine. So you have four, four neurons right at the head and two neurons just below that. So it's essentially four CEP neurons, two ADE neurons, and then you have two neurons, which, is, which are more at the tail, which are called PDE neurons. So essentially, you just have four plus two plus two, which is eight neurons, which send out dopamine. So how is a dopamine transmitted and who are the receptors and how is it made? You have tyrosine, which is essentially an amino acid that is converted to dopa, which is then converted to dopamine. Dopamine is filled into vesicles and it is released from the presynaptic. It then binds its receptor, which is on the postsynaptic neuron. And there are two types of receptors, dope 1, D1 type receptor, and dope 3 receptor. Both of them get activated when dopamine binds to them and cause changes in the postsynaptic neuron. And this is essentially what allows us to do a lot of things through the dopaminergic pathway. Apart from this, you also have DAT1, which is a dopamine transporter, which allows dopamine to get back into the presynaptic neuron from the space between the pre and the postsynaptic neuron. And you also have a, a receptor called DOP2, which sits in the presynaptic neuron and also allows for regulating dopamine levels. <clears throat> now, the next thing I'm going to tell you a little bit about 
is a little bit different. It's going a little bit away from dopamine and telling you a little bit about alcohol. So I don't know if you've seen people who are drunk, who are stumbling, they have a they're very uncoordinated. So essentially alcohol uh, makes you not walk properly or slur your speech. All of it is essentially affecting neurons at some level. So the neurons cannot now talk to each other properly and that's what prevents you from walking properly. It's what prevents you from slurring your speech. And this is because alcohol essentially affects diverse sets of neurotransmitters in our brain. It affects uh, neurotransmitters like glut glutamate, GABA, as well as dopamine. And all of these pathways are interconnected with each other. And this is why alcohol can affect multiple pathways and affect various aspects of um, movement, memory, and a lot of other aspects. A lot of work has, has been done previously on how alcohol and dopamine interact with each other. And a lot of this work is actually fairly contradictory to each other. So people have looked at the brains of alcoholics. So essentially after the person is dead, you can, um, if the family give, donates the body to research, then you can actually look at the brain of the alcoholic. You can make slices and you can actually look at different molecules, which, which I showed you, which were in the dopaminergic pathway and see whether there is any change in level between the brains of an between these molecules in the brains of an alcoholic versus a non-alcoholic person. And they found that the uh, dopamine receptor as well as the dopamine transporter that I talked to you about, both of them are decreased in certain regions in the brains of alcoholics. People have also found that in the presence of uh, dopamine, sorry, in the presence of alcohol, dopamine release could be increased. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to see, is there a link between dopamine and alcohol? And can we use C elements to study this link? So it was a fairly straightforward question. And we did a very simple assay, and this was based on previous work, which is shown that uh, when you put worms onto a plate that contains alcohol, the worms initially get paralyzed. And this work, I'm sorry, I haven't uh, cited it, is by Davies et al. It was published in the early 2000s. The worms uh, get paralyzed within 10 minutes. And you can see that all the worms just paralyzed on that plate. Then uh, in 20 to 30 minutes, they start recovering. And soon they start moving as normal. So essentially, they just get habituated to alcohol. And they completely, they move exactly like normal. They, don't, they have no effects. Uh, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to take mutants where we deleted, uh, where we had deletions in, in all the genes in the dopaminergic pathway. And we wanted to see if any of these mutants showed any differences when compared to our control, which is just a wild type strain, which has all the molecules in the dopaminergic pathway intact. So we take worms, we take them from a plate with food, put them onto a plate without food. Then we take them from this plate and put them onto the ethanol acid. And then we just look at how the worms are moving over an extended period of time. So we're essentially looking at it over close to 16 hours just to see whether there are any changes in how they move. And we found only one mutant, that is the dope 2 mutant, which is a receptor that sits on the dopaminergic neuron. We found only those mutants showed a defect. And I'm going to show you wild type worms. This is after they're habituated. This is after two hours on an ethanol plate. And uh, Dita, before we before we move ahead, can you please uh, elaborate on wild type and uh, mutated? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the wild type is essentially the control animal. In these animals, uh, you expect that none of the no genes are mutated. Um, so they essentially the genes are exactly the same as uh, as they were uh, as what you think is your basal control. In the mutant, you remove genes. So you remove, say, the gene which is required for uh, dopamine release, uh, that is a, a dopamine or the dopamine transporter, or you're removing the dopamine receptor. One of, one of these is removed in the mutant. So in this case, the dope 2 mutant is essentially the mutant that does not contain the, or the receptor that sits on the neuron that, can, that sends out dopamine. 
Um, and I'm just going to show you that again briefly. So we have dope 2 that sits on the neuron that sends out dopamine. This is called an autoreceptor. It sits on the neuron that sends out the neurotransmitter. These are called postsynaptic receptors. So we looked at all, we removed dope 2. We had lines that did not have dope 2. We had lines that did not have dope 1, that did not have dope 3, that did not have DAT1, that did not have CAT1. So we looked at everything in this pathway, uh, which uh, uh, in, in mutants that had that gene deleted. The control, on the other hand, had all the genes normal. There was no defects in the dopaminergic pathway. And that's what we call as controls. So here, you see wild type animal, which is a control animal. It's moving fine. This is essentially how a CLNS moves. It's moving fine on a plate after having uh, sat with ethanol for more than two hours. Initially, it paralyzed and then it uh, recovered after the paralysis and now it's moving perfectly fine. Now, when you look at the dope 2 mutants, you're going to see that it's very different. These animals were treated exactly in the same way as the controlled wild type animals. And you can see that they move very differently. They're not able to move. The anterior, the front of the worm is trying to drag the back of the worm. The front is at least moving a little bit. The back is just completely unable to move. So then we thought, okay, if this is what we see, can we actually, um, articulate this phenotype that is can we you know measure some aspects of this phenotype and actually plot them so for that my, uh, to be uh, to uh, a postdoc pratima and a graduate student anuradha who did all this work what they did was they decided to, to use two separate parameters so the first parameters the parameter they looked at was they looked at the number of times the body was bending in the anterior part and in the posterior part Posterior is always going to be blue in all my graphs. Anterior is always going to be black in all my graphs. So they're looking at bending in the anterior part and in the posterior part and the number of times the body is bending on that plate in one minute. And you can see that in the control animals, that is the wild type animals, the body in the anterior part is bending close to 20 times. Some of them show a little bit more, some show a little bit less, but around 20 times. In um, and then in, uh, again in wild type, in the posterior part, the body is bending around 16 times or so. While you can see in the mutants, there's a huge decrease in the number of times the body is bending. And you could have seen that from the video itself. That they, it was much less. Right? So around 10 times in the anterior part, because the anterior keeps trying to bend. But the posterior, it's very close to zero. It's like two or three times that it's able to bend. So, the, so you can see that there is clearly some defect that is having in locomotion. The second thing that they looked at was the amplitude. The amplitude is essentially this distance. The distance from when you draw a straight line through the middle of the animal, where the distance between the highest point, that is the amplitude. They looked at the amplitude and they found that the amplitude was around 80 micrometers in the case of the controlled wild type animals. And it dropped sharply, especially in the posterior part in the dopamine mutants, it became much less when compared to the control animals. And you can see that the blue, the posterior is much less than the controlled wild type posterior. So we thought, okay, this is very nice, but we need to do the proper controls, right? So we've seen this in wild type and in dope 2 mutants, but what if dope 2 without ethanol also has problems moving? And wild type, are we sure that there are no problems between ethanol versus no ethanol after two hours? So we did some of these control experiments. And here you can just see, this is the control wild type animal without ethanol and with ethanol. And you can see that without ethanol or with ethanol, the number of body bends, both anterior and posterior are very similar uh, to each other. There's no difference. NS in indicates non-significant. While if, if, and you also look at the amplitude of body bends, both anterior and posterior, and again, you see there's no difference between wild type animals without ethanol or those which were on ethanol for around two hours. So the next thing we asked was, okay, if we look at wild type animals and the mutants in this dope two animals, are there any defects in the absence of ethanol? So no ethanol, is there any defect in movement? And we found that there was no defects in movement. You can see compared to the wild type control animal, 
in the presence of in the absence of ethanol dope two mutants show exactly the same uh, phenotype they move ex the number of body bends looks very similar as does the amplitude of body bends so all of this now indicated to us that what is happening is that when we remove dope two maybe it's because of dope two what we're seeing is that in the presence of ethanol the worm is not able to move normally so the next thing we decided to do was we decided to put back dope 2 into these animals. So we just inject uh, a plasmid uh, that is a piece of DNA that contains the dope 2 gene along with other elements that are required for the expression of the dope 2 gene and into the worm. And then we look at it in the next generation and the generation after that. This DNA sits around in the worm as what is called an array. We only pick up the worms that have this array and we look to see what happens. And we see that this loss of dope 2 that we see is completely restored to normalcy. So you can see that when we put back the dope 2 into these mutant dope 2 animals, they now move just like the control animals. There's no difference, whether it is the number of body bands or the amplitude of body bands. So now they're back to normal. So now the next question uh, we wanted to ask was, is, so, I'm sorry, this keeps coming on my screen, so I get a little confused. One second. I can't get rid of this. Okay, thank you. So the next question we wanted to ask was, was, was what we were seeing in these dope two mutants, was it because of dopamine? And how do we do that? We did that with a very simple experiment. We had a mutant that is required to make dopamine. So CAT2 is an enzyme that is required in one of the early steps of dopamine. Without CAT2, you have very little dopamine. And you can see when you lose dopamine, the worm moves fine. It moves just like wild type. In fact, it moves a little bit faster on ethanol. So what we next decided to do was we made, we removed CAT2, which is required to make dopamine, and we also removed dope 2. So when you remove both of them, if dopamine is what is required for this dope 2 phenotype, if you remove dopamine, you should get the same kind of phenotype as loss of dopamine shows. And that is exactly what we see when we remove dopamine from these dope 2 mutants, you go back to looking at very much like wild type, right? like the control animals. They don't show any phenotype. So this indicated to us that maybe dope 2 is actually functioning through dopamine to allow for this phenotype or this uh, lack of uh, movement phenotype. So the next thing we thought, okay, what we can do is we can just add exogenous dopamine onto the worm, onto a wild type control worm and put it on an ethanol plate. And then it should be behave just like the dope 2 mutant because what we are seeing is probably increased dopamine levels. It's not decreased dop dopamine levels. So this is wild type ethanol, no dopamine. <clears throat> this is wild type without ethanol, with just dopamine, and they both move fine. But when we take the wild type control worms, give them dopamine, and put them on an ethanol plate, the worm is just not able to move. It looks just like the dope 2 mutant. So all of us, all of this essentially indicated to us that the mutants in dope 2 appear to release more dopamine in the presence of ethanol. So essentially, when you remove dope 2, you have more dopamine. So then the next question was, I told you that there are only eight dopaminergic neurons in C. elegans, four of them in the, sorry, six of them in the head, one of them which is more posterior. So we thought, okay, which of these neurons is involved in this process? And we thought the easiest way to do this is just delete the neurons, just ablate the neuron. We decided to ablate the tail neuron first, and if you don't have the neuron that sends out dopamine, then what will happen, even in the absence of dope 2, where you have this locomotory defect, you should not see this locomotory defect. It should just look normal. So you have this neuron, PDE neuron, which has dope 2. And when you remove dope 2, you have too much dopamine. But if PDE neuron itself does not exist, you will not have too much dopamine. The worm will move normally. And that is exactly what we see. This is wild type, which has no ablation. Wild type where the PDE is ablated is completely normal. There's no problem. 
In dope 2 mutants, which is no ablation, the worms are not able to move normally. You can see that in the number of body bends and the amplitude of body bends. And you remove this neuron from these dope 2 mutants and it goes back to being exactly like so all of this essentially showed us that it was this one neuron that was involved in this process. And when you removed this neuron, you prevented too much dopamine from being released. So if this neuron had dope 2 and when you remove dope 2, too much dopamine is released. When you remove the neuron itself, then dopamine cannot be released. So the last part that we wanted to look at was we wanted to look at what is a circuit? How is this uh, dopamine actually affecting uh, downstream neurons. So now just to give you a brief idea as to what kind of different neurons we have. So all of us, we sense the external surroundings. We sense good things and bad things through what are called sensory neurons. And this neuron in C. elegans is the PDE neuron, which has dope 2, which releases more dopamine in the presence of ethanol when you don't have dopamine. So these are sensory neurons which sense the outside. These then talk to neurons which are called interneurons. The interneurons actually compile all this information and they then give relay this information to, to neurons which are called motor neurons. Motor neurons form connections with muscle and they tell the muscle move, run, walk, run away, all of this comes because you have sensory information coming from the first level of neurons being processed through interneurons and being relayed to the motor neurons to the muscle. So, so we, we wanted to see whether this pathway was what, or this circuit was what was being active in these, in these dope 2 mutant animals. So one of the ways of doing it was to actually just look at neurotransmission at the level of the motor neuron. And in C. elegans, you have a, very similar to humans, you have cholinergic motor neurons. So the neurons send out a chemical, which is called acetylcholine, which binds to acetylcholine receptor, which is on the muscle and allows them and allows the muscle to move, contract. And if there's not enough acetylcholine, the muscle will then relax. So what we did was we increased acetylcholine in these worms. And we saw that when we increase acetylcholine, the, these are wild type control worms where we just allow for increased acetylcholine levels. And you see that the worms are unable to move. They look exactly like if they had too much dopamine and they're not able to move in the presence of ethanol. So, uh, uh, so what you can see here is just wild type worms. <coughs> With, uh, with regular amounts of acetylcholine levels and wild type worms with more acetylcholine levels. And these worms are not able to move. They, they, can, they reminded, reminded us uh, that uh, they look very similar to the dope 2 mutants that I showed you earlier. So what we have so far is this phenotype in these dope 2 mutants appears to be due to increased acetylcholine levels. So now I've showed you that from a sensory neuron, somehow we've relayed inf information to the motor neuron to give rise to more acetylcholine. So I'm going to end with, <coughs> with the possible model that we have and what, what we think. So this is the neuron that I've been talking to you about, which is dopaminergic. It makes synapses with an interneuron called GVA. C. elegans, I told you, has around 7,000 synapses. So just imagine you have almost 1% of your synapses between this one neuron, PDE, and another neuron called DVA. DVA neuron sits at the tail and it goes right to the head of the worm. And in the, in the middle, it's making all these connections with the motor neurons. So previous work had very nicely shown that when the muscle contracts, calcium enters into the DVA neuron. The DVA neuron sends out a chemical called NLP12, which binds a receptor on the acetylcholine neuron and releases acetylcholine. Other work, which is more recent, had shown that PDE neuron, mm. which is the one that has dopamine, this neuron also makes contact with the same DVA neuron and allows for muscle contraction. What 
I hope I've shown a little bit about, I haven't shown a lot of the experiments because I, I, I was kind of just hoping to give you a flavor of some of the experiments that we do in the lab, but I'm happy to answer more questions on this. What we see is that in the PDE neuron, you have the dope, dope 2 receptor. In the absence of the dope 2 receptor, a lot of dopamine is released from the PDE neuron. This dopamine then binds to the dope 1 receptor, which sits on GVA, which is the interneuron. So you have sensory neuron, PDE. It is talking to the interneuron, TVA, And this, in turn, set, releases the chemical, more of the chemical. And this chemical binds to a receptor, which is on the motor neuron. So sensory neuron talking to interneuron, talking to motor neuron. Motor neuron then sends out acetylcholine. And acetylcholine affects muscle by causing increased muscle contraction. And hence, the worm is not able to move because the muscle is very contracted. <clears throat> With this, I'll be ending the talk and I want to thank the people who did the work. This was work which was done in Isomali by Pratima and Anuradha. And I want to thank um, CGC and Aji for multiple strains and plasmids. Um, uh, Randy Blakely, Ron Evans, and Rene Garcia's labs for reagents. Uh, Ananda Goldshoy from NDRC collaborated with us for the, for the experiment where we removed the neuron. <clears throat> I want to thank Welcome DBT India Alliance for uh, intermediate fellowship, um, uh, Aisha Mohali for intermediate funds, Department of Biotechnology for funds, and now I want to thank IIC where we've set up our lab. Our lab is, um, is pretty much set up now in IIC. And these are the first few people who have joined our lab. Our lab is a bit bigger now, but because of the pandemic, I haven't actually gone around and taken photographs of the new lab, of, of the new people in the lab. With that, I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, although you mentioned that you would be using certain jargons, but you made the utmost effort to simplify it with certain diagrams or, you know, going back and forth. And I'm sure our viewers really, really got intrigued by the entire mechanism of how you've been working and everything. And so there are a lot of questions lined up and I am going to shoot the first question to you. Uh, so how is the number of protein coding genes almost the same in a human brain and a worm? And while this number is so high, why is the number of neurons or the synapse so low? So I'm sure they're referring to the genes and versus the synapse. You did answer a little bit of it by saying that there are other types of proteins also, but if you could elaborate. Yes, so um, this is not in the human brain, this is in humans. So I'm talking about uh, genes which are in C. elegans versus humans. So I, that might've been a little confusing because I talked about neuron number, synapse number, and then I talked about proteins. So it's not proteins just in the brain, it's the proteins all in the humans. So, though, so the number is very similar, probably because the worm needs to do a lot of things that humans do. So as I showed you here, you have sensory neurons. They have to have certain sets of chemicals that are sent out from the sensory neurons. Sensory neurons have to talk to interneurons. Again, you have to have a set of chemicals and the interneuron level, which have to be sent out. Um, you're, you have motor neurons. As I said, we have acetylcholine motor neurons. Humans also have acetylcholine motor neurons. Acetylcholine receptors, humans also have acetylcholine receptors in, on the muscle of our arms, for instance. Worms have it on the body wall muscle. So although there is lots and lots of differences, at the molecular level, a lot of the genes um, are I, don't, I wouldn't say necessarily conserved at, as in homology is exactly, you know, it's exactly the same sequence. The sequence could be divergent. The other, uh, um, other point is that in humans, you have a lot more variants of the same protein or the same gene. In C. elegans, you might have fewer isoforms or variant, variations of the gene. So that might be different, but actually, you know, the basic genes which are coding for a lot of uh, important proteins are conserved. Um, I think it's probably because the worms actually do a lot, have a lot of behaviors and maybe most organisms have multiple behaviors that we are yet to study. And that's probably why they require a lot of genes. True, true. Uh, also, another clarification was that you mentioned about 25,000 protein coding genes. 
So is that the number of total functional genes or the entire genome? No, it's not the entire. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, microRNA. You, I mean, you have a lot of genes that code, code for um, what was called junk and people realize it's no longer junk DNA. So that's a lot. So the actual amount of DNA is very different in the two organisms. It's only what people have found so far as protein coding genes, essentially. Uh, which is similar, but um, uh, the other, the, the DNA where you have other aspects of DNA, um, enhancers, all of that is very different. Or regulators, moderators, Regulate, et cetera, yeah. right, totally true. Okay, so uh, another question an audience member has asked is that why is C. elegans used widely in genetics? Although you did cover, but anything apart from that, if you would like to add? Um, so I think uh, some of the, so essentially, C. elegans, uh, the rate of growth, the life cycle is three days, which is very similar to yeast. Um, if you're actually mating yeast, that's about how long it takes. So this, this is very fast. And you have a system that has neurons that, you know, you can actually study, you know, do some aspects of neurobiology, look at molecules and neurons in a system that is growing so quickly. And you also have, uh, so I said that they were homophrodites, but apart from homophrodites, you also have males. So you can make them together. It's very easy to mate them. You, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a very easy cross to do. It's very easy to get, uh, you know, double mutants, uh, triple mutants. Uh, you know, you can think of whatever, whatever kind of mutants you want and you can probably get it. So it's a very genetically amenable system. However, it's not as genetically amenable yet as Drosophila. Drosophila has been, uh, you know, being, been used since early 1900s. C. elegans only since 19, uh, early 1970s. So there's a huge you know, difference in the amount of time that the two have been used. But Drosophila has a lot more genetic tricks, a lot more manipulations that can be done. And uh, you know, far more easier to use in some aspects. But there is one really, uh, you know, really useful tool with C. With C. elegans has. You can just take the C. elegans and you can just freeze them. And you can thaw them 50 years later and the worms survive. I mean, if you've done the whole process correctly, obviously if you've done it badly, then they won't survive. But if you've done the process nicely, uh, they will survive. So, uh, so you don't actually lose the worms. You can keep them for forever. So that's another really big advantage with worms. That's not a genetic advantage, but it is an advantage. And that's very interesting advantage as well that you could actually just thaw them back to life. Yeah. Uh, so another question pertaining to this only is that when you create a mutant, when you genetically modify this organism, uh, which particular, do you modify a particular part or is it a life stage cycle that you modify? Uh, so you modify the genome of the organism, essentially. So what, I mean, very simplistically, what people have done many years ago, when, I mean, there have been lots of modifications. Is there. But very simplistically, you could give a carcinogen, um, you know, a, a mutagen as it, uh, it's, it was just actually a carcinogen. You give a mutagen to, to the animal and that will cause breaks in the DNA. Um, now, once you get the breaks in, in the DNA, you will see the breaks in the, uh, in the uh, progeny of the worms that you've treated with the mutagen. Then you uh, propagate the progeny and then you go on to see where the breaks are and you characterize it. Now with whole genome sequencing, that's fairly straightforward. You can do it much more easily than you could earlier. And now you can do site-directed mutagenesis with you know, CRISPR Cas9. I don't know, don't want to get into it, but you can do literally whatever you can think about. Think of doing, you can pretty much do that. In uh, C. elegans is a really good organism to work with because you can literally do anything you want, and it's very fast. And you, you know, you'll be able to make your mutant quickly, figure out what it's doing um, a few weeks down the line. So that it has a lot of advantages. And uh, the other, another huge advantage is with CRISPR, since we've talked about it, I mean, a little bit, I'm not gonna talk more in details about it, but you can do point mutations. You can actually do structure function analysis of genes. So if you have a site that is interacting with another gene, you can you know, mutate that site to some other residue and see whether that interaction happens. And you can do this for like all the genes, literally. Uh, you know, fairly quickly. So it has huge advantages that um, allow you to really get lots of ideas into uh, uh, you know, molecular aspects of genes. So even in this new field that you're, I mean, that you're talking about, again, you would be using the progeny to see the effect. Yes, yes. It's always the progeny. It's never the guy who you inject. 
So you I mean, inject so the all DNA. All of them may not be affected, and you yes, may... yes, absolutely. The progeny and the progeny's progeny, and then you know, down the line, it's not the person, the parent. So the next question from our audience is: In the number of body bends and amplitude pictures, do the DOP two posterior part? How come the number of body bends is similar on, but amplitude is higher? Than each other. So why does the amplitude and that change? Um, so that's a very good question, and we actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, I think it might be because the worm, at least in the in uh, the posterior part, uh, uh, sorry, in the anterior, uh, no, the posterior, the anterior part is moving. Let's move it. So at least in the anterior part, the anterior part is really trying to move. So it's actually trying to make a bend. And maybe that is a ripple effect in the posterior that you see some of them are able to make some sort of bend, although they're not moving. Um, but to be very honest, I mean, this is just, I'm not 100% sure what the answer is. I don't really know the answer. Another question uh, pertaining to the observation and the data uh, plotting is that how do you take the readings of this body movement, et cetera? Is it a time frame video film that you take? Or yeah, it's a time frame. Okay, and then how do you plot them on the graph? Do you use a software? A we software? use Prism. Uh, we use a software Prism. So uh, we've actually published a protocol paper earlier this year, which you can actually go and look at. It's uh, you know if you search for Anuradha Singh and Pratima Pandey, it's a bio protocol paper. It gives you exactly what we've done uh, to uh, when we're doing these recordings and exactly how to do the recording. So we use uh, ImageJ software. Uh, from NIH, and uh, we and then we use GraphPad Prism to plot plot the data. Okay, so in general, uh, the dopamine makes the worm excited or happy, or is it? Um, it causes too much contraction of the muscle, is what we think. So essentially, it goes through, or you know, it's a sensory neuron, as I said. It goes through the interneuron, goes through the motor neuron, and ca causes too much acetylcholine to be released, and the and the muscle to contract too much. So it's not. I mean, I don't know. Happy. We haven't looked at emotions. People are thinking of, you know, are actually thinking of looking at aspects of, you know, emotions or things like that. It's hard. It's very hard to do that with worms. So it essentially causes too much contraction of the muscle, and that in turn leads to some sort of paralysis, or uh, you know, not able to. But I mean, I don't think you can relate it to emotion. I, I think it's very difficult um, other than very evolved animals or domesticated animals, you know, that you can actually read emotions. It's, it's not <laughs> something that's, that's trivial. Even, even with, you know, domesticated animals like dogs, it's not completely trivial to read emotions. So with this small little worm, emotions is just not, not oh, even that. possible. So there's an interesting question that has come up on freezing that uh, what is the significance of freezing the worm when we can just use another one? Won't it be easier to change the neurons or to change, you know, to give to be, uh, make a mutant out of a fully functional uh, worm rather than using a one which has been already frozen or? That is correct. I agree. If you want to make a new mutants, you, you take a, a you know a new you know wild type strain and start making the mutant. However, if you already made mutants, you made triple mutants, you made quadruple mutants, uh, you have these dope two mutants. The best thing is just to freeze them and then take them out whenever you need them to do the experiment. No, I mean otherwise you have to remake the mutant every time, which is you know, which takes time. Even though it's a it's a fast process comparatively, it still takes time and. Um, all of us have finite times to finish projects. So you, you know, it's, it's always nicer if something is already ready to available. You so just take it out, free thaw it, and you're, you're ready to go, right? So that means if a comparative study has to be made or if one wants to go back to something to verify, then these worms which have been frozen yes. are more handy yes. as compared to doing the process again. Exactly. And, uh, you know, just uh, as a, uh, uh, you know, as a, addition to that, there are labs who actually study what happens to uh, the genome of C. elegans over generations. So it's something like um, um, evolutionary study where every year you can freeze sets of worms or every three years or whatever. And you can actually see whether from the same parent, are there any differences in the genome? Or what is the rate of mutations that are happening? You know, those kind of studies are also possible because you can look at it, you know, generations, 100 generations previously or 1,000 generations previously. 
And that obviously will only happen if you can actually freeze those worms and keep those worms. And, and, and then look at that. So now the question is that how is dopamine level measured in C. elegans? Um, so it, 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 we haven't done these experiments, but it can be measured. So uh, uh, I'm not completely sure, but I think you have chemicals which will allow you to like rupture the worm and then uh, you know take out the contents and actually assays that will allow you to measure to the organs. So it has definitely been done. So an interesting question that has come up is that what inspired to get you into the research field that you are right now in and why this worm out of like Drosophila is so widely accepted and used. What inspired you to use this worm? Okay, so a couple of things. So um, I did my PhD in Drosophila. Uh, so that, I mean, it's a fantastic system. Um, but I was always, you know, we used we, we plug uh, Drosophila wires with cotton wool and cotton wool always makes me allergic. So, you know, half the time I'll be sneezing a lot. Uh, and then I had to wear a mask. Now, you know, it's just like karma. Now I'm wearing the mask all the time anyway. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> so, <laughs> but at that time, during like half of my PhD, I had to wear a mask every time I was in the lab. So, which was a little bit, I found, found it uncomfortable. Also, um, uh, I... Uh, you know, the other thing was Drosophila as a community is a very big community. And uh, C. elegans is much smaller again because it started later. And uh, I was interested in coming back to India uh, uh, to set up a lab. And at that time, when I was looking for postdocs, uh, there were two things. One is it had to be a very genetically. So I really wanted something where I could do beautiful genetics with. And uh, honestly, because of, you know, just how many years a system has been used, Drosophila and C. elegans are your two best bets in some ways. Um, obviously, mouse, there's beautiful genetics now with CRISPR. At that time, there was no CRISPR. Um, again, zebrafish, you could, you could do nice genetics. But I wanted something that was simple, not super expensive, um, you know, quick, all of those things. And uh, since I also wanted to, you know, I was thinking of starting a lab back in India, I thought, C. elegans was actually an ideal system when I was thinking about it. So that, that was... was the mother of search out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a very interesting question that has come is that how can we relate the absence of dopa or the presence of a gene or whatever the study is with respect to humans? So right now we cannot. I mean, we have not, but it's uh, but that's very interesting, right? You can you can think of maybe because DOP two has a homolog, D two type receptors are there in in uh, vertebrates in mouse, so you can think of maybe taking this kind of study to um, uh, to uh, you know uh, to mouse or rodents and see whether they, uh, you can make mutants in DOP two. They might they probably already are there in D two receptors and see whether they these are affected by ethanol. I, that study has not yet been done. So you can actually see whether ethanol affects them, um, whether there's, there are def defects in you know, either locomotion or how they behave in ethanol. And then if there are, then you can think of taking it further. However, having said all that, uh, the idea, you know, the, the circuit that I showed you, that's a fairly conserved circuit that we do know that, you know, dopamine in sensory neurons, works through interneurons, affects acetylcholine levels. It's a fairly conserved circuit. So that's, it's not that far-fetched to say that maybe something like this might be seen in uh, vertebrates or other higher organisms. And the, the second thing is in Drosophila, there was a study, which I actually, I usually end with that slide, but um, because I didn't want to go into too much jargon, I did not talk about it. In Drosophila, there was a study where they showed that when there was, there were more um, acetylcholine synapses, that is you have more, as, possibly have more acetylcholine, the worms are more um, susceptible to ethanol. So uh, they are, they, you know, just very similar to worms. What we think, because of too much dopamine, we think there's too much acetylcholine, which makes them more susceptible to ethanol. And they've shown that right at the, the bottom part, that when you have too much acetylcholine, the worms are more susceptible to ethanol. So it does, they seem like some of this might be relevant, but again, unless you actually do these experiments, you would never really know whether that's going to be yeah. the case or not. Uh, so an audience member has asked us that what are the interesting bioscience companies globally which you think can disrupt this space and what makes you think so? Disrupt the pace of what? Disrupt this space. Oh, this space? Um, 
I really don't know <laughs> at all. I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, what are the, there are lots of companies that I do know and a lot of companies are coming up. Um, you know, there are a lot of, now there are a lot of incubators that are being set up that allow for companies to come up. But I don't know, I mean, see, the work I do is essentially very fundamental, very basic research. So I don't know how, unless I can actually think of some sort of application, you know, how interested anybody would be in it. So unless, you know, you take it to other organisms, it's, I don't think that happens. But having said that, a lot of what we know, you know, be it CRISPR, be it uh, RNA interference, a lot of it has come from very fundamental research, or be it even RNA vaccines for that matter. It's all come from very fundamental research. So, you know, I think there's a space for both of them, but I really, I am not the person to ask about how companies can disrupt the space. So moving back to creating mutants, uh, there's a question, while removing the genes from an organism, is there an upper limit to the number of genes which can be removed before the pro progeny evolves into something completely different? I don't know, I doubt it. Chances are it's gonna die far before it evolves into something completely different. So um, yeah, it's very unlikely. So even if you say you remove five genes and the worm lives, those are essentially when, the, when you remove a gene and the worm and the animal dies, it's an essential gene. So once you remove an essential gene, then it's going to, that's it. No, it's not, it's, you're not going to be able to keep it alive. And so, obviously we won't get the progeny that we are actually yeah, exactly. for a Yeah. And you also are going to have genes that when you disrupt, you, it won't be able to give you progeny as well. So it's very unlikely that it's going to like become something different. I think you have to do a lot more alteration of the DNA as opposed to just removing genes. So I think one of the students have asked us that could you recommend some books regarding basic neurosciences? Um, yes. Um, principles of uh, principle of neuroscience, Eric and Dell, and uh, also uh, the development of the nervous system, um, which is something that I teach a lot, development of the nervous system. Uh, I've forgotten the authors. Um, it's right there. <laughs> if you want me to show it, <laughs> but yes, th those are some of the books. You can email me about it. I, I can I can send you that. I think the member can do that. So there's a question: uh, Can you induce a double or a triple mutant specifically, or do you let them mutate naturally and then find out which mutation has taken place? You can induce. So you can induce it earlier. You people uh, you. Uh, uh, in Drosophila, for instance, you have P elements, which are next to genes, and you can, you know, specifically target genes. Now with CRISPR, you can pretty much induce in anywhere. You can get mutants anywhere, any specific gene of interest. I think with our understanding of the DNA, it's become more easier to splice it at a, uh, cut it at a particular exactly. end, give it something new. Yes. So I think both of them are quite, but in the field of research right now, are do we still look at just like in giving it a carcinogen or something and then just no, it's, what happens no i mean people would do it if you want to do a screen to look for say an enhancer or a suppressor of a phenotype something like that i mean i'd be interested i don't think i can convince people to do this in my lab anymore you know they just laugh at me They're like what well, which genes do you want me to do? you know just do crispr and get it over and done it. Why are you doing this old-fashioned forward genetic screen? But I think the forward genetic screen still is really interesting and can give you things that you might not even have thought about. Uh, so another question would be that, uh, how do you actually locate the, these neurons? Because the worm itself is a microscopic organism and then, you know, how, as in, do you do a dissection of it? And no, you don't, you don't need to do a dissection of it. So I said that it was, uh, uh, so it is... Uh, uh, transparent and uh, since a lot of the neurons are known people know what genes are expressed in which neurons so what you can do is you can just take a promoter of say a gene that is expressed in let's say uh, pde because i talk so much about pde you can take a promoter of a, of a gene that's expressed in pde and say let's say specifically expressed in pde a lot of work has been done because you can actually take out neurons individually and uh, and uh, do uh, fact sort them and then actually figure out what the, all the genes that are expressed in uh, specific neurons so let's say x gene is expressed specifically in pde you can just take the promoter of x hook it onto gfp and put it in the worm that will only light up in pde so you know that that neuron is, you know, the GFP is there. 
So, uh, you, see, they, I mean, it's it's like a lot of years of research. People have done this a lot. So, uh, you know, they know a lot about which genes are expressed in which neurons. So it's quite easy to actually f- figure out neurons. Um, still, there are, of, of course, you know, you're not able to get specifically one neuron. You could get a cluster of three or four neurons in most cases, but still that's kind of good enough for most studies. So with neurons only, how do you measure the speed at which a neuron is transmitting information? So you, you can do electrophysiology. So you can clamp onto a neuron and uh, actually figure out the current. Of- to a neuron? Yeah, you can do it, yes. I- even in CLA. So that you have to dissect open the worm and, and okay. patch onto the neuron. So. Interesting. Very interesting. And um, there's one question over here. How do muscle cells distinguish signals coming from the brain? For example, sometimes our response is slow and sometimes it's like faster. How do How is that fast and slow determined. So that's also, uh, I mean, there are multiple factors. One of it is neurotransmitters. So uh, you can have neurotransmitters, which are fast, uh, you know, chemicals that bind to ion channels. You can also have neurotransmitters that uh, bind to uh, metabotropic G protein receptors. Um, You can, apart from that, you can have slow transmission through neuropeptides. So uh, there are a lot of factors which are interconnected. So I'm not completely sure in this instance what happens, but you have a lot of different factors and it depends from, um, uh, you know, neuron to neuron. It depends from muscle to muscle. It depends from organism to organism, um, which kind of organism, all of that plays a very, you know, plays a big role in this. So unless you're very specific in exactly what you're looking at, uh, there could be many, many parameters that one can think of. So even in C. elegans, do you find the fast twitch muscles and the slow twitch muscles? No, 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 no. Because um, action potentials have only recently been found in C. elegans, so they don't have sodium channels. Okay. Um, so they are calcium dependent action potentials. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you don't, you don't, I mean, they, see the thing is it's so small that it's not like an axon has to, you know, travel a large distance. Uh, uh, an audience member has also asked us from your research work, we see that the PD has DOP2 and it is present in the posterior part of the worm. Is this the reason why the posterior part is more affected in the DOP2 mutant? Yes, we think so. Yes. Okay. We, at least we think so. We are, I mean, it seems the most logical explanation. Um, because of mus- uh, because over there you have more dopamine and that affects those muscles fa- more than it might be affecting the anterior muscles. Okay, so could you suggest some experiments that a 12th grade student could do on their own related to neurobiology? Uh, see, I have really never studied biology, so it's a little bit uh, difficult. So I actually um, studied uh, my bachelor's was in math and physics and chemistry, but mostly math. Uh, but, uh, but I began to really like genetics because it was a lot like math. And that's essentially why I decided to you know, pursue genetics. So I'm not really a neuro, you know, neurobiologist or neuroscientist per se. Um, so I, I don't know. So, okay, I can think of one experiment, which actually one of my postdocs was uh, talking about. So say you have ants moving towards different substances. So you can, you know, figure that out. Maybe you can actually see whether they respond, they prefer one substance versus another. Even if you say salt versus sugar, if you put, you know, an ant in the middle, will it, will it move towards one versus another? And then, you know, narrow it down to two substances. Maybe it likes them both. Will you move towards which one more? And if you do it with enough number of ants, for instance, you can, you'll actually come to some conclusion that maybe it prefers this versus that. And all of that is essentially because the sensory neurons are attracted to one Q versus the other. So, I mean, that may be something fairly simple that one can think of doing without too much effort. Uh, I mean, not effort, you still have to figure out how to get ants and things like that. But that might be something you think of. And please do think of the animal protection laws. And in case you try something on humans, the consent forms for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so I wouldn't even think about going. <laughs> I mean, especially if you're a 12th grade student who just wants to try some experiments. This might be something that you could think of. So thank you very much. I think you have really broken down the jargons into smaller chunks for our students to understand.
and uh, you know the length and breadth of neurobiology that you covered was actually amazing and the work that you have done is truly inspiring your story itself is very inspiring from being uh, in mathematics field field specifically and moving to then genetics and moving to neurobiology uh i think it also gives a silent message to all our viewers that you know you don't block your fields you actually open your fields sometimes when you keep on your academic journey yes absolutely so, thank you very much and now i would like to hand over to parneet thank you so much thank you all so much thank you for that wonderful session professor and uh, very well moderated too um so thank you both of you uh Ruchi, you you've taken out your valuable time. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure our audience too enjoyed being a part of the discussion as much as I did. Uh, we will be sending a recording of today's session uh, via email to all registrations, and the video will also be available on YouTube's channel. I did hear a request for some uh, books there or authors rather. So uh, if Professor can uh, send that list to us, we can add that to our email. i would also request all our participants to take a minute to fill our feedback form so that we can constantly work on delivering excellent lectures uh, the link to the feedback form is in the chat box uh, and will also be emailed to you before we wrap up today i would like to inform our audience that round 1 admissions uh, to ashoka university's undergraduate program will open on 4th of october 2021 you do not have to wait for your board marks to apply so you can start your application right away uh, join us for a webinar on undergraduate admissions process and application form to understand ashoka's holistic admission process and why you should apply early in round 1 this webinar is scheduled for friday october 8th from 6 to 7 pm and will will be conducted by mercia prince director office of admissions ashoka university the registration link for this is provided in the chat box with this we come to the end of today's session if you have any further queries regarding today's session or would like to know more about ashoka's unique interdisciplinary science programs you can visit our website www.ashoka.edu.in or write to us at apply@ashoka.edu.in or call us at the number shown on the screen see you on 8th october at 6 pm take care and stay safe